How do you do? There's an old saying among sailors about the storms of life. You can't change the direction of the winds that blow, but you can adjust your sails. In today's story, John Newton's beliefs and plans for the future were about to change so drastically that he'd be forced to make more than just minor sail adjustments. He would face monumental challenges that would test not only his bravery, but his conscience. And that's when his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Land ho! The shores of England. Ha! I thought we'd never see them again, Captain. Don't get too comfortable. We're heading out again next month. Not I, remember? I'm returning to an inheritance. Oh, Right, your um, promised inheritance. A slave trading worked for a time, but now I'm a rich man. Rich, yes, about that. And soon to be a married man. The Catlett family expects Polly to marry well. Oh, Newton, I have some um, bad news. What, John? There is no inheritance. But. Captain, you, you said... Your father wanted you back in England, so he told me... You lied to me! You're a good sailor, John. You'll find another job. No! Don't you understand? Polly won't want a common sailor. Then you'll find a better use for your life than this. Not likely. Ah, I survived a catastrophe for this. Look at it as a new opportunity. Opportunity? Ha! My whole future is shipwrecked. Being a sailor in the 1700s was a rough job. But it was all young John Newton had ever known or wanted. And when the winds of life began to change, he could remain blinded by his own choices or be swept up into a new and amazing direction. Based on YWAM Publishing's Christian Heroes Then and Now series by Janet and Jeff Benge, we bring you part two of the true story of John Newton, right now on Unshackled. Deceived. How could they do that to me? No inheritance, no Polly, and no job. I wanted to fight someone, but the captain's ship had already sailed, and so had my father's. I dreaded having to plead with some new captain to hire me. And then there was my reunion with Polly and her mother. Oh, my, what a harrowing experience. Well, it was for sure. The ship was all but wrecked in the storm. He says it was God who intervened, Mother. I called out to God and, well, he saved me. Oh, thanks be to God. But someone who is saved by Christ follows him. Aye, and I'm trying to do that. For what reason? Pardon, ma'am? If your only reason for following Christ is to gain approval as a suitable husband for Polly... Oh, no, ma'am. John, I... word has come to us about your behaviours. Fighting, drinking, gambling. Not to mention the slavery you trade in. But, ma'am, England's economy depends on the slave trade. Perhaps. But what does your heart say about that now? Well, I... I regret my sinful behaviours, John, but... your father mentioned you hoped to marry Polly. He did? Yes. But we agreed that there must be some changes first. Mother did say we can write letters, John, and maybe someday... Someday I'll be the man you deserve, Polly Catlett. I'll prove it to you. Prove it to yourself first, John Newton, and to the God who saved you. Though I understood why I needed to change my wild ways, my foremost thought was how to make my fortune. I chose to swallow my pride and ask Joseph Manesty for a job aboard one of his merchant ships. He was a friend of my father's, and when I approached him, he surprised me with an offer. Made me wonder if the hand of God was at work in my life after all, in spite of my shortcomings. Word is, John, you have a good eye for choosing the strongest and best slaves. I do know how to bring in the high prices at market. How about managing a motley crew aboard a long ocean voyage? Managing? 
You mean as a captain? Captain? Aye. How's that sound? Captain Newton. Like something I've been waiting for, sir. Then it's done. You choose the crew best suited for sailing to the African coast. Aye, aye, sir. I only wish your father was here to watch you set sail as captain. I won't let you down, Mister Manisty. Captain Newton, <laughs> my own ship to manage. Perhaps it really was the hand of God that changed my fortune. Maybe Polly would agree to marry me now. But as I considered the dangers on a trip like this, I knew my own behavior could make or break this opportunity. My mother had once taught me the Bible, and since I wanted to guide well the sailors under my command, I purchased a journal to write down every Bible verse that seemed appropriate for teaching my motley crew. Men, we are gathered to ask the Almighty to watch over us as we set sail. We'll be observing the Sabbath while at sea. They're going to preach at us, Captain. All day long or just on Sunday? <laughs> uh, well, we'll start with Sundays. When did you get religion, Captain? Oh, you ain't never seen you act like a saint yourself. <laughs> Aye, true enough. But God changed my heart. Oh, and you're holding the Bible there to prove it. Merely holding this Bible proves nothing. But the stories and claims inside about Jesus can change a life. Just from stories. Stories which I will begin sharing through Bible studies starting next Sabbath. Any complaints? Bible study. Good then. Hear the word of God from the Book of Psalms. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. I took my responsibilities seriously, especially the spiritual needs of my crew. Although, as captain, I had to deal harshly with those who disobeyed orders. The many Sundays of learning Bible stories together spoke to my own heart as much as to the sailors who listened, especially those hearing the scriptures for the first time. At every port. I posted a letter to Polly, hoping the changes in me would become evident to her, and more importantly, to her mother. He must be writing every day. Well,、uh, oh, he is well. <laughs> That's it. Mother, God is truly at work in his life. Listen, I I find I am more eager to read the Bible and remain faithful to prayer while I lead my crew. And here, here, the grace I found in Jesus now compels me to live my life to please Him.、Mm. He's sounding more like a minister instead of a scallywag, or perhaps more like a man you approve of. <laughs> It isn't just my approval he seeks. It says here, he's growing uncomfortable with the treatment of slaves on the ship. Good. Now we must pray for a greater awakening in his heart regarding slavery. And. He'll be in port soon, and oh, oh, and expecting a decision on the other question. The other question, Polly. <laughs> Seems your heart has already decided that, hasn't it? Our wedding was small, but our young hearts were overflowing as we took our vows. Because I lived mostly at sea, our times together were few but precious. While at sea, I learned to handle most situations without telling Polly of the danger surrounding me. Although I commanded with a firm hand, even the most experienced captains deal with life-threatening situations, and I learned to sleep with one eye open, or suffer the consequences. Captain, we got trouble. <laughs> uh, oh, what now? It's the crew. They're scheming, gonna sell off slaves and divvy up the loot. Sailor, are you saying my crew's talking mutiny? Aye, sir. Gonna toss you to the wives and run off with the bounty. <sighs> I've tried to treat them well, but this stops now. What you gonna do, Captain? What I must remind them who's captain here. Ordering the perpetrators to be flogged gave me no peace of mind, because I had experienced the grace of God myself. I wondered if something I had done gave them reason to mutiny. 
for the first time my standards were higher, because I answered to a master in heaven. When the journey ended, Manesty offered to build a brand new slaver for my next voyage. But my growing faith made me hesitate. So I sought wiser counsel. Name the ship yourself? That's what he said. If I agree to captain Oh, that's quite an honour, John. Yes, but... What? It must be a slave ship. I see. Transporting African men and women to be sold against their will. Are they not created by God, just as we are? Why does England allow this to continue? England's economy. They won't even consider abolishing slavery, my dear. All the chains and the shackles. I... Then you're thinking of leaving the sea? <sighs> I've been a sailor since the age of ten. But what would you do? <laughs> well, you're going to laugh. Never, dear. I'd study to be... a pastor. Not surprising. And I'm not laughing either. No? Ha! <laughs> Imagine it, Polly. This wretched sailor, a preacher of the word of God. God can use any sinner saved by grace. It is true. Perhaps as I take on this new journey, I'll ask God to open my eyes. And unshackle your heart? Aye. But at the moment, too much thinking is giving me a headache. <sighs> Perhaps another cup of tea will help while I get the biscuits. Uh, Paul. Paul. John! <sighs> John! Oh, help! The doctor said my attack was a kind of apoplectic seizure that would force me to take life easier. It seemed that neither God nor the doctor approved of my continuing as a ship's captain, so I wasn't sure what was next. Though Manistee's new ship sailed without me, he recommended me for an important job collecting taxes on ships at port. This gave me more time to be at home than I'd ever had before. What appeared at first to be a setback actually led to new ideas and unexpected blessings. Sermon too long for you, Polly dear? You seem in a frightful hurry. <laughs> Sorry, dear. Just thinking on it. It was a thoughtful sermon indeed. John Wesley never disappoints. He's an unusual preacher. Aye. Traveling the countryside on horseback and all kinds of weather. At least you know God hasn't called you for that. <laughs> True. I've not the strength nor the health for it. You haven't changed your mind about preaching, have you? Oh, I long to stand in a pulpit one day, but it's not to be. Why not? Really? Need you ask? Polly, you know... One time. You got a bit tongue-tied and... It was a disaster. You're still young. You've got time to... At 33, perhaps this old sailor should stick to what he knows best. I seem to remember a verse that says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee... The desires of thine heart. Yes, but... But what? It's just... Uh, I have no formal training. I... I just see no path forward. Well, my wise husband, what do you tell me when the path ahead is hard to find? Keep walking with God, and he will show us. Then step lively, sailor. We have new paths to find. So we forged ahead, trusting God to direct our way. One of our new paths came when Betsy, Polly's orphaned niece, came to live with us. Then, when we least expected it, God granted the desire of my heart. I was ordained as a minister and given my first pastorate. I also began to write about my life at sea, and the stories received much attention. While I used the opportunity to speak boldly on the evils of the slave trade, I didn't know then that my courage was about to be tested in a new way. Papa? In here, Betsy girl. Papa, there's a letter for you. It's marked urgent. What's all the commotion? Our Betsy seems especially excited about the mail. Well, look who it's from, Papa. Oh, it's from William Wilberforce. Little William. Ha, a bit of a rascal, as I recall. Papa, he's a statesman, a member of Parliament. And he isn't so little anymore, John. You knew him. He's famous. Famous for being very outspoken. This is an unusual request. Aye, very unusual. Don't keep us in suspense, Papa. He wants to meet with me. 
And? He asks that our meeting be... Hmm. Kept secret. Why? Possibly because people would recognise him. And me. And your father's views on slavery are well known. But a secret meeting, Papa. That sounds dangerous. But if God is leading me, he will protect me. Besides, he's brought me safely through stormier seas than this. Like the poem you wrote, Papa. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace, God's amazing grace, will lead me home. Why would an up-and-coming politician want to meet secretly with an old preacher? As far as I knew, William had lived the privileged life of a rich and influential young man, and my first concern, whatever the reason for his visit, was to ask about his health, his spiritual health. (coughs) Couldn't you have chosen a better secret place? Sorry, John. I didn't think we'd get as much attention in these stables. Except for the flies. (coughs) So, what's on your mind that you need to keep secret? I need your advice, old friend. Advice you don't want to share with your statesman friends? Exactly. At least, not yet. I see. But first, William, may I ask you a question? Certainly. I recall as a child you attended church and read the Bible. Have you now abandoned the faith you grew up in? Quite the contrary. I have returned to it, sir. And how does that fit in with your lifestyle and political position? I deeply regret the shallow, selfish life I have sometimes led in politics. I've decided to follow Jesus instead. Ah, A decision you'll never regret, friend. But that's also my concern. Should I give up my seat in Parliament? And why would you do that? It's not easy to stand for Christian values as a statesman. But, William, God needs faithful men who are willing to take a strong stand as both a Christian and a statesman. John, if I remain, there's going to be an ugly battle to abolish slavery in England. Good. Yes, I've I've read your writings on the inhumane treatment of slaves. That's a battle that will require a statesman who has both courage and faith. As a Christian and a statesman, I am willing to take a stand, John. Would you consider standing with me? (laughs) Oh, lead the way, young man. This old sailor has seen too much to remain silent. It was the beginning of a partnership that only God could have planned. Wilberforce became a strong voice in Parliament while I continued writing of my experiences aboard the slave ships, even capturing the attention of the Prime Minister, William Pitt, My eyesight was beginning to dim with age, but Betsy had become my faithful right hand, taking down all I needed to say. When my book, Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade, became widely read, Wilberforce and I were called before the Parliamentary Council, presided over by William Pitt himself. Order! Order! Gentlemen, Today we hear from Mr. John Newton, pastor and former sea captain who has first-hand knowledge of English ships doing business in the slave trades. Thank you, sir, for allowing me to speak. Although I confess this is a business which my heart now shudders. Why is that, sir? I've been sickened watching children torn from their mothers, men and women beaten, starved, chained together in spaces so close they... They can't even move. And Mr. Newton, as harsh as that seems, would you have us forget the economic needs of English citizens who depend on slave labor? Respectfully, sir. Which is the greater evil in the sight of God? Order! Order! Are there not other ways to encourage growth in the economy than the horrific enslaving and mistreatment of men and women who are created in the image of God just as we are? Order! One last question, Mr. Newton. In all of your experiences with slavery, what would you say has affected you the most? The shackles, sir. The beatings and starvation still tear at my heart, but 
watching people as they are shackled for life. Well, I know it must bring anguish to the very heart of God. Wilberforce and I continued to fight, even though it seemed we were fighting a losing battle. Each time the issue of slavery came before Parliament, the economic concerns caused them to turn a deaf ear to our pleas. As devastating as each loss was, my greatest personal heartbreak was when I lost my beloved Polly to cancer. I knew I would never recover from her loss. But I was thankful for Betsy, who stayed by my side. With my body weak and my eyesight failing, I was still determined to preach the gospel and speak up for abolition as long as I had breath, even though it was clear that this old sailor was slowing down. Papa, are you sure you have the strength to preach today? No, my dear. My own strength is all used up. But God still gives me a reason to preach. Papa, the congregation would understand if it's become too much for you. (laughs) Would you have me stop while I still have breath? Hmm. What would Mama say about that? Ah, my dear Polly. Uh, She would remind me that I'm not the fiery captain of storms I once was. But she wouldn't fuss over me. Because she knew you wouldn't listen anyway. (laughs) I... And because she knew our times are held in better hands than our own. Is that the message you'll be preaching this morning, Papa? Perhaps I will. How unspeakably wonderful it is to know that all our concerns are held in hands that bled for us. It was clear I was very close to finishing the work the Lord had called me to do on this earth. I spent my days dictating letters and sermons to Betsy, who had become my eyes when my own had failed. My greatest regret was knowing that the bills we had proposed to Parliament had not brought an end to the evils of slavery. Then, unexpectedly, Wilberforce visited me again, and I couldn't imagine what was on his mind after all this time. Papa! There's someone here to see you. Wilberforce. (laughs) John. Is that you, young rascal? It is, sir. And it's good to see you looking so well. Oh, looks can be deceiving, you know. (laughs) Betsy, fetch tea, please. Oh, no, thank you. I can't stay. Then what's on your mind, friend? John, another vote has been taken in Parliament. Another vote? After so many years? John... Our voices have finally been heard. What do you... It passed. This time our bill passed. They abolished? Yes. No more slavery. Ah, Betsy, did you hear? I did. Papa, praise God. No more slave ships will set sail from England. No more men, women and children ripped from their homes and sold. No more profiting from the misery of our brothers and sisters. Praise be to God. No more chains. Unshackled. (laughs) Unshackled at last. You've done a great work. Only by the grace of God. Ah, how thankful I am that I lived long enough to hear this news. I can meet my saviour now. A happy and fulfilled man. Let's hope not for a while, Papa. There's still much more work to be done. Uh, No, not for me. I don't fear death, dear ones. When Jesus reached down to rescue this wicked and sinful man, he changed my heart. God has promised that there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give me in that day. That is his promise for each of us who believe, and it's more than this old sailor deserves. God's undeserved, amazing grace. Although my memory's fading, my friend, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great saviour.
My father, John Newton, died peacefully at the age of 82, knowing that his heart had been fully unshackled by Jesus Christ. I can imagine what a wonderful reunion it was when his beloved wife, Polly, was there to greet him. He was laid to rest near the church he had pastored, and inside that church are three stained glass windows. Two of these depict slave ships on stormy seas. The middle one is a likeness of John, preaching from his pulpit. Inscribed beneath them are the words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. The song penned by John Newton so long ago has continued to be sung by Christians all over the world. The words bring hope to each person who puts his trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. John's heart had been unshackled from sin through his belief in Jesus and his trust in the undeserved grace that is the gift of God. Has your heart been unshackled, friend? And if you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, why not do so now? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 promise that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation.